pleasant morning to all of you. All of you who are here with us this morning, those who are coming, may God keep them safe and bring them safely. I want to say a pleasant morning to also our visitors. Um, feel at home. You're among the people of God, and God's presence is here with us this morning. You know, I came across a text this week, and I found it rather sweet, so I want to share it with you before we pray. It's found in Galatians, um, in Joel chapter 2. Um, the text is from 21 to 23, but particularly 21. Um, Joel said, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. You hear that? Now, I want you to listen to the translation now from Young Translation. Young's put it, but Young Translation puts it this way. Do not fear, O land, joy and rejoice, for Jehovah have exerted himself to work. You imagine that? No, you, you imagine that? You get the beauty of how Young puts it. Young says that the God of heaven, the infinite God, is exerting himself to work. He ain't only working. He's doing it with great exertion. He is extremely serious about the work he intends to do for us. And he's exerting himself. He's making every effort possible and will leave no stone unturned to accomplish what he needs to accomplish for us. That is the goodness of God. Let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we come to you who are our Savior, our Lord, our King, our Master, who have showered upon us such love that you will leave no stone unturned to win us back as you have done in Christ and to allow us to remain in heavenly places in Christ and to redeem us from all sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to establish your righteousness in our hearts and in our mind so that we may be able to stand without an intercessor Glorifying your name and, bring glory, and bearing glorious fruit unto you. Oh, Father, accomplish that within us. Grant us the gift of your spirit. Encircle this church with the presence of your angels. And as your spirit speaks to our minds and our heart, we ask, O oh, Father, that we may, by, by humility and submission, yield all to you, is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Last week, I had cause to read to you, and I'm going to read it again, because it was a blessing to me, and I want it to be a blessing to you again. There are two readings I'm going to read. It has to do with how we view the hastening and hindering of the cause of God. And I want to read it again, because we have to know, and we must realize, that our sins cause great suffering to the heart of God. And it is not a suffering that you see in the cross of Calvary and you look back on it as an accomplished act that is finished. It is a continuous inflicting of pain to the heart of God. So I want you to listen. It says, those who think of the result of hastening or hindering the gospel work, think of it in relation to themselves and to the world. Few think of it in relation to God. Few give thought to the suffering that sin has caused our creator. All heaven suffered in Christ's agony, but that suffering did not begin or end with his manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. Every departure from right, every deed of cruelty, Every failure of humanity to reach his ideal bring griefs, grief to God. So God is pained in, every failure, in our every failure to reach the standard for which he has exerted himself to accomplish in us. He is pained. And not only that, there's another reading. In Review and Herald, the last hand I gave you, but... Would that we would comprehend the significance of the words 
Christ suffered being tempted. Let's comprehend it. She's going to explain it. While he was free from the taint of sin, the refined sensibilities of his holy nature rendered contact with evil unspeakably painful to him. You got that? The refined sensibilities of his nature rendered contact with evil unspeakably painful to him. Yet with human nature upon him, he met the arch deceiver face to face and single-handed withstood the foe of his throne. Not even by a thought could Christ be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Not even by a thought. Satan finds in human hearts some points where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his, attempt, his temptations assert their power. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The storms of temptation burst upon him, but they could not cause him to swerve from his allegiance to God. Praise the Lord. Now, when you look at, and the text that we will look at next is a text found in Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. And we shall have cause to go to a message that was preached by Elder Jones for over, since 1888. This message is found in 1895 General Conference Bulletin. So you can understand how this message was preached and the length of time it was preached. And unfortunately, it looked as though that it had no result upon those who listened because we are still here. Now, and you, says Ephesians 2, 1 to 3, who were dead by reason of your trespasses and sins, in whom you once lived according to the course of this world, according to the ruler of the realm of the air, of the spirit that is now energizing the sons of obedience, of disobedience. Among them we also had, we all, we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, gratifying the desires and impulses of the flesh, and were by near children, nature children of wrath, just like everyone else. Now, gratifying the desires and passions of the flesh in the King James Version is, is understood as fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Right? Now, the word for passions, the word for de desires, sorry, desires and impulse of the flesh, the word for desires is, is really talking about the will and the bent and the inclination of the flesh. So our flesh is not inclined to do anything good. I want you to get that clear because the Bible describes what the works of the flesh are. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, the works of the flesh are outlined. And the works of the flesh are against God. Now, the other word used for impulses of the flesh is in reference to thought, intention, the mind, the intellect, and the understanding. So, so when you talk about desires of the flesh and of the mind, you have to understand that when Adam sinned and gave way to the flesh and the mind succumbed to the temptations of the flesh, that not only was the flesh made sinful with its desires, but the mind also was made weak. You get where you're coming from? And unless we understand that our minds are weak and that our flesh is weak, we will not be able to understand really and truly who we are and why we need God and Jesus so much. But Jones puts it this way. He says, our minds have consented to sin. We have left we have felt the enticements of the flesh, our minds yielded, our minds consented, and did, the will, and did the wills and desires of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The flesh leads, and our minds have followed, and with the flesh the law of sin is served. 
When the mind can lead, the law of God is served. But, our, but as our minds have surrendered, yielded to sin, they have become sinful and weak. You got that? As your mind has surrendered and yielded to sin, it has become sinful and weak. They ha- and are led away by the power of sin in the flesh. Now, now, the flesh of Jesus Christ was our flesh. You see what is described in Galatians chapter 5? Fornication, adultery, all those inclinations that are residents in our flesh, and all those sins that are resident in us, quarreling, various, um, all those things that are residents in the flesh, they were, they, all those things were resident in Christ's flesh. Listen very carefully. All the tendencies that are in our flesh were in his flesh. Join upon him to get him to consent to sin. Suppose he had consented to sin with his mind. What then? Then his mind would have been corrupted. And then he would have become of like passions with us. But in, that, but in that case, he himself would have been a sinner. He would have been entirely enslaved, and we all would have been lost. Everything would have perished. I now read from, the, uh, and, now, and, we, and he quotes the quotation that I read to you, where that in Christ, that in him, Satan could find nothing upon which to exert his power. So where does the temptation start? It starts in the flesh. Satan reaches the mind through the flesh. God reaches the flesh through the mind. Satan controls the mind through the flesh. Through this means, through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, through ambition for the world and honor and respect of men, through these things, Satan draws upon us, upon our minds, to get us to yield. Our minds respond. And we cherish that thing. By this means... His temptation assert their power. Then we have sinned. But until that joint of the flesh is cherished, there is no sin. There is temptation, but not sin. Every man is tempted, tempted when he's drawn away thus and enticed. And when lust has conceived, when that desire is cherished, then it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is, when it is finished, brings forth death. Some sinful desire with us is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. But he could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. Jesus did not consent to sin. Thus you see that where the victory comes and where the battle is, it is right upon the line between the flesh and the mind. The battle is fought in the realms of the thoughts, of our thinking. The battle against the flesh, I mean, is fought altogether, and the victory run in the realm of the thoughts. Therefore, Jesus Christ came in just such flesh as ours, but with a mind that held its integrity against every temptation against every inducement to sin, a mind that never consented to sin, nor never in the least conceivable shadow of a thought. Listen very carefully. And by that means, he has brought that divine man mind to every man on earth. Therefore, every man for the choosing and by the choosing can have that divine mind that conquers sin in the flesh. In 1 John 5.20, Young's translation puts it this way. You know that the Son of God has come and has given us a mind. So, praise God. The problem is solved. Our minds, weak, sinful. The flesh, has, the flesh controls it at its will. Jesus has come by his spirit, and has granted us, by the spirit of God, the mind of Christ. And that mind of Christ 
if allowed to have its way, will keep us from falling and present us faultless before the throne of God with exceedingly joy. This is how God intends to bring everlasting righteousness to us as a people and to deliver us from every sin that is resident in the mind by which Satan exercises his power. We have a power that has come to us and we have read in Joel chapter 2 that God is now willing to exert himself to keep us from falling. So this is, the good, this is the goodness of God. Now, you have to understand the flesh because not many people understand the flesh. You have to understand what the flesh is all about. And it's, there's some quotations which, she says, it is one of Satan's most successful devices to lead men to the commission of little sins, insignificant things. Listen carefully. To blind the mind to the danger of little indulgences. You understand where you're coming from? The little things that you find insignificant. Satan loves to get you involved in those things. Little digressions from the plainly stated requirements of God. Many who would shrink for, of, with horror from some great transgression are led to look upon sins in little matters as of trifling consequence. You understand where you're coming from? They, they, they're, they're, they're small things, so... You don't worry about them things. If you were worried about committing adultery or doing something bad, but little things like, uh, we all know the little things. I ain't get involved in things, but the little things we, we know. But those little sins eat out the life of godliness in the soul. The feet which entered upon a path diverging from the right way are tending toward the broad road that ends in death. When once a retrograde step, retrograde movement begins, no one can tell where it may end. So I have to take care of the little things. Little spots is spoil, spoil vine. So the little things are of consequence. Good. Now, there's some other things that she brought, which I find interesting. All the followers of Christ, we're dealing with the flesh, because we've got to understand the flesh. And it's trickiness and how it, how it deals with us. All the followers of Christ has to meet the same malignant flow that assailed their master. With marvelous skill, he adapts his temptations to their circumstances, their temperament, their mental and moral bias. And I can give you an example about this mental and moral bias just now. Their strong passions. He is ever whispering in the ears of the children of men as he points them to worldly pleasures, gains, and honors. All this I will give you if you will do my bidding. We must look to Christ. We must resist as he resisted. We must pray as he prayed. We must agonize as he agonized if we would conquer as he conquered. Now listen. We must learn to distrust self. You hear that? A lot of us have a lot of confidence in what we think and what we believe. You understand? We have a lot of confidence in ourselves. We must learn to distrust self and to rely wholly upon God for guidance and support, for the, a knowledge of his will, and for strength to perform it. We must be in communion with God, prayer in secret, prayer while the hands are engaged in labor, prayer while walking by the way, Pray in the night season, the heart desires ever ascending to God. This is our only safety. You hear what's your only safety? Your only safety is not to have confidence in yourself. Because to have confidence in yourself is to have confidence in the flesh and in your mind and in your thinking. And all of that is written off by sin. So we cannot have confidence in ourselves. Our only safety is to pray in secret. Prayer while the hands are engaged in labor. Prayer while walking by the wayside. Prayer in night season. The heart desire ever ascending to God. This is our only safety. In this manner, Enoch walked with God. In this manner, our exemplar obtained strength to tread the thorny path from Nazareth to Calvary. So we understand where our victory lies. 
Our victory lies in not depending upon our thinking and upon ourselves. Our victory lies in having the mind of Christ. And that mind of Christ kept Christ from sinning. We have, we, we have been given that mind by the gift of the Spirit of God. And that mind is able to keep us and to keep us firm in our understanding of the truth of God and of the will of God. And that is the only way that we can overcome our sinful desires and the desires of the flesh. Now, I want to give an example. Now, this example is about a man called Brother Bates and a man called Brother James White. I, 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 it's, a very, it's a very serious example. And it has to do with moral biases. Moral biases and mental biases. Now listen very carefully. Brother Bates was a man that was teaching some error in the church. And according to Sister White, James White, with some godly jealousy, began to deal with Brother Bates. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. So I can read it for you. I saw that, uh, that the above named errors of Brother Bates and other more dangerous brought confusion and destroyed James' confidence in Brother Bates. You listen? So James' confidence was destroyed in Brother Bates. I saw that James at first had godly jealousy for the truth. Then other jealousies crept in until he was jealous of almost every move Brother Bates would make. You hear that? See, you see how the flesh is work? Start out good. But if you're not controlled by the Spirit of God, it can go the other way. These wrongs I saw, she says, must be taken out of the way. Now, now listen very carefully. She further said that Brother Bates did not have the gift of discernment. So he would go off on tangents. Now, the gift of discernment is not looking at a man and knowing whether he's a Christian or not. The gift of discernment is knowing the truth. The gift of discernment is knowing what is right and what is truth. It's not about judging a man's character. So Brother Bates didn't have the gift of discernment. But listen carefully. But he had a gift to talk the word. She says, none had a gift like his. He could talk to a small company when there was no one, when, when there was one or two people present, as well as to a large company. She says, this gift was greatly needed in the church. So Brother Bates had a gift that was needed in the church, but he had a problem. He didn't have the spirit of discernment. You get where you're coming from? While Brother, while Brother James now, for, by godly jealousy, end up being jealous of everything that Brother Bates said, all because Brother Bates was teaching error. Listen very carefully. Listen carefully. Listen to what she says. She says, I begged Jesus to forbid that there should be any discord among the shepherds. You hear that? She says she begged Jesus to forbid that there should be any discord among the shepherds. For then the flock will be scattered as sheep without a shepherd. I prayed Jesus to encircle them now in his lovely arms. I saw that the disunion between the shepherds had afflicted the flock. Then I saw that and then they had afflicted the flock. She says that Brother Bates' heart must be open, ready to yield up a dear point when clear light shines. You get that? I saw that he must be more like Jesus. Everything in heaven is in perfect order and the events of judgment will come in perfect order. Then I saw James and Brother Bates. And listen to what the angel say. Said the angel, press together. Press together, press together. Press together, ye shepherds, lest the sheep be scattered. Let one love one another as I have loved you. Swim, swim, swim. Plunge deep, deep, deep into the ocean of God's love. Come into a nearness with God. I saw that we must overcome perfectly and get the victory over the powers of darkness. So listen to me careful. You know one of the chief works of the flesh is division. And Satan finds ways 
to divide the people of God. The moral biases that we have, moral and biases, she says, she call it, she call it moral, a moral bias and, and a mental bias. You, saw, you know, some of us like things to be done in a specific way. And somebody else do it in another way. And we judge that other way as not the right way because our way is righter than their way. I said, you get where you're coming from. You get where you're coming from? Have you understood where you're coming from? All of that is self. Anything that creates division or separation between you and a brother is of self. It is the word of God. It comes no more from the revelation of self in your experience. No, it comes from prejudices of the mind. Because our mind has certain prejudices as to how things should be done or not to be done. The only thing that our mind should do is to hold to the word of God and allow that word of God to be a guide. And every single member must submit to the leadings of the word of God via the spirit of God amongst us. And there will be perfect peace and perfect harmony. The entrance of thy word bringeth light. And with Christ there is peace and there's harmony. There are no sighs or no divisions. There's no party spirit. A party spirit is a function of the flesh. There is no this body against this body. I believe this body against that next body. It is not to be found in the church of God. There are but manifestations of the flesh. And they were never found in the mind of Christ because the mind of Christ could never be brought to yield to the flesh. He took the flesh. He carried it to the cross and he crucified that flesh and it never returned from the cross. It was completely annihilated and he rose and he has come to give us a mind. Now the works of the flesh, and I have to finish, but I have to, I have to mention these because, yeah, I have to wind, I'm going to wind up now. Oh, the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, 9 to 21. They have something called sinf- selfish reveries. You know what's a selfish revelry? You know what's a selfish reverie? The service of a party, party spirit. And that comes to me more and more than ever. Feud, a faction, contentiousness, disposition, and selfish ambition. These are works of the flesh. Dissensions. Dissensions. Standing apart. A division. Being separated in your mind from your brethren. Because you believe certain things about your brethren and, your brethren and you think your brethren believe certain things about you. So you hold them off in righteousness according to you. You understand where I'm coming from? Listen again. Three. Another word. Divisions, strictly a choice or opinion. Hence, a religious set, a fraction in a religious set. Divisions among the people of God. That is nothing but the manifestation of self. Listen again. Something called orgies. Now, when you hear the word orgies, you think of one thing. This is how she described it. A festive, a festive procession. What is she talking about? Where's the festive procession? You, you, know, you, know, you know Spring Garden? Spring Garden is a, fest, a festive procession. A bunch of dancing up, going on a big length down the street. All of that is the manifestation of self. I have no place in the people of God or in the church of God, not even to look upon. Not only that, a merrymaking. All of that, a revel, lewd, and moral feasting. All of that is included. All of those things are works of the flesh. F- we're finished? So all of these things, envies, dissensions, drunkenness, quarreling, strife, all of those are manifestations of the flesh. And all of them, we have participated in them one way or the other. And in our minds, there are seeds left that Satan asserts his power and causes us to sin and brings division in our families, in our churches, and among ourselves. And listen carefully, the mind of Christ has kept all those things from appearing in the life of Christ. And Christ has come and he has given us that mind. And that mind means that we are to submit to God and allow God to have his way 
in our lives by living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You cannot trust yourself. You can't trust your mind. You have to abide by the revelation of God via his spirit. And that is your only safety in this battle against sin. There is no other way that God has chosen other than Christ to redeem humanity. And what God has done in Christ, he is able to do in you. And the fact that he's, be, he's able to do it in you and he wants to do it in you, he's willing to exert himself beyond what he has ever done in the past to accomplish the work that he will do in you. The battle is fought in the realm of your thinking. If you see a sister walk and she passed by you and she forget to speak, something might be on her mind. Don't allow Satan to put in your mind that she got something against you. That's what we are called the, that's what we are called, that's what we are called the mind being affected by the flesh. All of that is enmity against God. You have to kill it at the root. That there be no divisions and separation between you and a brother or sister. Otherwise, how can we... Oh, you see, the scripture says that all those who practice these things cannot see God. So there are men in the church, I have to finish, but there are men in the church preaching the truth, teaching the truth, but their minds are prejudicial against certain things. God says, away with all that foolishness. It is nothing more than foolishness. We have to have the mind of Christ, and the mind of Christ will bring us to the foot of the cross. The mind of Christ will transform our character. The mind of Christ will keep us from sin. If there is anything that will separate us from God, is when we do not choose to give ourselves wholeheartedly to God to be controlled by his mind and not necessarily by our thinking but by the thinking that is found in the word of God via the spirit of God for he that hath the spirit of Christ is all of Christ a man that does not have the spirit of Christ is none of his and this process of justification that we preach that was preached by Jones and Wagner the focus of this message and the emphasis of this message is victory over every besetting sin I know I was told that time gone, so I have to close. But God will give us the ability. He will reveal to us our defects of character, and He will bestow upon all who seek His aid strength to correct their errors. May the Lord add His blessing to the reading of His word, and may we, as a people, allow this word, the truth of this gospel, that have come back to us in blazing light. I see it really and truly as once again the Spirit of God bringing to us the power of the latter rain. I don't know how you see it. It is a message that is supposed to unite us in Christ and to each other and to separate sin from our lives. Because in Christ there is victory and victory forevermore. So this message coming to us is nothing but the Spirit of God seeking to bring us to the stage in which every defect of character is overcome. And we are ripe to receive the latter rain to complete the work of grace in our souls and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to make an end of sin in our lives and in this world. May God have his way amongst us May we, by submission, recognize that we are weak, one, our minds are weak, two, and that we need the mind of Christ to survive against the onslaught of the enemy of our souls. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we are thankful for your love as manifested on the cross of Calvary. As we behold Jesus Christ, we see, Lord, that self was crucified on the cross. And that Jesus Christ has taken our sinful self, this sinful nature, with all its tendencies towards evil. He never allowed any thought from this nature to come into his mind. But he, uh, but he was so submissive to you. He kept back his righteous self, and he allowed, O oh Father, the mind, your mind, to be revealed in his experience and in his life. 
And all of that, all that he has accomplished, he has come and give it, given it to us as a gift. Well, Father, we are paying for the suffering that we've caused you in the past, in the errors that we've made, in what we have done, in the thoughts that we've thought, in the words that we've spoken. They have been hurtful to you, and you have suffered immensely for the cross is just but an example of the sufferings of God from the entrance of sin that has inflicted your soul. Teach us how to love you, O Father, with all our hearts and with all our souls and with all our minds. Teach us how to respond in love to your kindness towards us. The fact, Lord, that you have, we have not left us alone, but that you have told us, Lord, that you will not count our sins or our trespasses against us that you have reconciled us to yourself in Christ Jesus, that you have forgiven us, and that your mind towards and your thoughts towards us are thoughts of peace, thoughts of love, that you are willing, Lord, to draw us into closer fellowship with you. With all our defects of character, Lord, you have come and that you have given us your spirit. And we know that your spirit is manifested and you have been manifested in Christ to take away our sins. Oh, Father, may that we allow that spirit to work mightily in our experience. That we be willing to give up all that is unlike you and submit to your mind, to your leading, to your guidance. Not trusting in ourselves, but trusting in you to keep us and to strengthen us to walk in your way. These mercies we ask in Christ's name. Amen.